Ariel Marcy, thank you so much for coming on to Evolution Soup from your home in Brisbane, Australia. You're an evolutionary biologist and PhD candidate at the University of Queensland and an educational game designer. As well as communicating science through games, you study the evolution of Australia's fascinating mammals. So uh, how have you been doing, Ariel, like so many of uh, my guests lately? You're working from home. But I suppose for a game designer, that's an ideal situation. <laughs> yes, an introverted game designer for sure. I've been playing a lot of board games. Uh, Wingspan is one of my favorites currently. Um, but I also have to say it's been very productive in science as well. I've been writing up my thesis and got to turn that in just a few weeks ago. So it's been, uh, yeah, it's a good, been good use of time at home. Are you, are you sort of dying to get out into the field or back to the university or? Oh, always. <laughs> I definitely miss my <laughs> colleagues and friends at the lab. And um, there's a, UQ has a beautiful, University of Queensland has a beautiful campus. So um, missing that a bit wow. too. Well, before we get into all the aspects of your work, let's just hear a little bit about your background. You were originally from the States. So does your love of animals and biology go back to growing up in the USA? Well, it certainly goes back to growing up in Vermont, which is a very rural, beautiful, nature-oriented part of the States. And I spent a lot of time outside with my family, that's for sure. But I actually have an inciting incident for my love of biology. And that's when uh, I was six. And I went to the Audubon Society, um, which is for birds. And mm -hmm. my friend and I got to do an owl pellet activity where, you know, we're doing the very beautiful exercise of going through owl pellets, which are regurgitated from the <laughs> stomach. It's just all this fur and um, material that's not um, <laughs> digested. But... I got to find skulls and bones inside and I got to kind of pick them out. It was sort of like an archaeological dig, but biological. And I just loved it so much. I kept those bones on my dresser for years until they stank and my parents found them and threw them out. So oh. I've, I've been studying rodents ever since, I suppose. Ariel, your work focuses on what is often referred to as Evo Devo. Now, for anyone who is unfamiliar with this term, how would you explain what is meant by Evo Devo? Sure. So Evo Devo is shorthand for evolutionary development, and that's a field of biology. It's interdisciplinary, and it mixes together everything from evolution as well as everything from the study of development, which includes genetics, as well as looking at the very precise stages of how you go from a single cell into a whole organism. And what's cool about mm. that is what we're really interested in is what kind of mutations, particularly to the developmental process, uh, are possible for a certain org organism and how that might determine some of the patterns of diversity in those groups. So I have a good example. Um, mm. You all know giraffes, right? So they're mammals like us, and they have really long necks. But like all other mammals, or nearly all other mammals, they only have seven cervical vertebra in their necks. Oh, yes. And so to get that long neck, they've had to stretch all of those vertebras to get them really long. But on the other side of the evolutionary tree for land vertebrates are the dinosaurs. And now sauropod dinosaurs like Apatosaurus also have long necks. But what's cool is that they had a different strategy for getting that trait, as instead of having just being limited to seven, some of them had up to 19. So something is going on in dinosaurs versus mammals about what is possible. And that led to two different characteristics when these two long-necked animals. So I think that's really cool. And that's sort of what, what Evo Devo is all about. Well, Australia is well known for its many indigenous mammals, most famously the kangaroo. Uh, wombats, wallabies, kangaroos, these are all marsupials found in Australia, though there are other species located in the Americas, such as the opossum. What exactly is a marsupial and how are they distinct from other mammals? Yeah, great question. So uh, if we take mammals as a group, I like to say there's like three flavors of mammals. And one is the egg-laying monotremes. And mm. these still lay eggs like all ancestors of mammals. And then you have marsupials and placental mammals, which are both the major groups that have live young. And the difference is how long their pregnancy is. So the marsupials have really short ones. And then those embryos develop mostly in the pouch, that famous pouch. And then um, yep. placentals like us have that longer pregnancy. But 
the marsupials actually originated in South America and then migrated uh -huh. through Antarctica into Australia where they had a major radiation that's really famous. But there's over a hundred species still in South America. And the one that got past Mexico is the opossum. And so that lives large in our collective pop culture references, I suppose. Absolutely. And for anyone who doesn't know what, what is a monotreme, just tangentially speaking. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so um, monotremes only have um, five living species uh, these days. So most famously is the platypus. And then you've also probably heard of the echidna. Uh, and they're so cool. Yeah. Um, like they have uh, venom, like the males <laughs> have venom. And uh, mm. electro sensation, uh, particularly in the platypus, they use that to find their prey underwater. Um, so they're both really cool. And they might tell us a lot about the ancestral mammalian ancestor, or they might just be really neat, have evolved all these things um, since they split off. So we're still sort of figuring that out. Well, for your PhD, your aim is to start to untangle the question of why marsupials are less diverse than placentals. And you're going to do this by studying Australian rodents. Isn't that right? That's right. So Australia is famous for its marsupials and its egg-laying monotremes, um, but not everyone knows that there are 60 plus native rodents in Australia. And rodents like us are placental mammals, and they only recently got it got to that continent. So Australia has been drifting northward over millions of years since Gondwana broke apart, and it finally got close enough to South Asia for some intrepid rodents to sort of uh, drift across certain um, parts of the ocean and then island hop over you know thousands of years of climate change and land bridges forming here and there and so um, once they got to Australia it was sort of a land grab because they were the only placental land-based mammal when they arrived so that sounds like a lot of qualifiers and it is but it's an interesting comparison because no other rodents have had that, had that situation before. And so we were very curious, one, would they behave differently? Would they evolve differently um, with this opportunity? And then once we understood how they evolved on the continent, the next step is to compare them to marsupials because they're a great control group. They're the only placental mm. land-based mammal uh, which is basically basically describes marsupial mammals because they're also land based. Um, so you can use that to compare what's happening with these two different species over the same kind of environmental changes and in the same geographical area. So uh, in your question, you mentioned that marsupials are less diverse, and by that I mean they have fewer shapes, and mm -hmm. we notice this especially in their skulls and in their forelimbs. And we think that this has mm. everything to do with how they develop. So this gets back to Evo Devo. Uh -huh. um, yeah, so marsupials have that really short pregnancy. And then what they have to do is this tiny neonate, the size of a jelly bean, is climbing up the mom's belly to get into the pouch. And then once they're there, they have to attach to a nipple in order to receive milk and then develop the rest of the way. So that means that there's this huge biomechanical stress on their forelimbs and on their mouth. Mm, um, yeah. And so that really has to be in place very early on. And what we think is that that means that it's very difficult for development to kind of switch gears and evolve a new morphology, so a new shape in those locations. So you have wonderful kangaroos, which have these amazing hind limbs, but their forelimbs basically look like any other marsupial. Um, mm. And so that's why we think, for example, we don't have any flying marsupials. We don't have any you know, aquatic marsupials. And most of them kind of have that same, same sort of look. Uh, but I was able to be on a paper with one of my friends and colleagues, uh, Kate Garland, who looked at bandicoots, which are a type of marsupial that doesn't have that arduous climb to the pouch. Instead, mm. these neonates sort of kind of slither um, down so that the mother kind of like tilts back to like give it an easier go at it. Um, and what we've seen is that actually it seems to lift some of the constraints. So not having to do that uh -huh. climb gives it more opportunity 
to uh, evolve. And what we're doing when we're, when we're looking at that is we're looking at the, the variation in the forelimb and the different elements of the forelimb. So like the fingers and then the forelimb and then the humerus and uh, the shoulder. Um, and then comparing that to the variation, the hind limb, you can do some analyses that uh, really help you figure out what is the developmental program doing in sort of coordinating the shape changes that happen. Is the forelimb mostly independent from the hind limb? Mm -hmm. Are the elements of each of those limbs independent? And that's the kind of, um, that's the kind of stuff that can tell you uh, what is the raw material for evolution to work with. And the more independent an element is, the more likely you are to have uh, diversity. Because if it's independent, you can make a change to it that won't change something else and potentially mess it up. Because of course, with mutations, most of them just screw it up and make that organism not viable. Um, so this is what I was actually looking at in rodents. Because rodents, while they're placental mammals, and I'll say a few things about placental mammals, the, the, the theory is that Placental mammals are so diverse. You know, you have everything from bats to whales to hoofed things to um, bipedal humans to, you know, everything in between. Um, when we think of a mammal, we're usually thinking of a placental mammal. And there's a reason for that. Um, there's thousands of species of placental mammals, whereas there's only 300 or so marsupials. And so the theory, the leading theory, is that it's all about that long gestation. So here's the evodivo again. So we think that long gestation mm. allows for a placental to, you know, really just luxuriate in that um, uterus and um, that allows all sorts of changes to be viable, which means that more variation in forms can evolve and survive. Uh, rodents mm -hmm. are unique in that they make up 42% of all mammal species. Huge. They're so successful. It's ridiculous. Um, not everybody knows this, but yeah. No. Uh, there are so many rodent species, and there's more than just the house mouse and the rat that we think of when um, we're thinking of a rodent. The deal with rodents is that they're unusual among placental mammals and that they have very short pregnancies. So they're actually a little bit like the marsupial in that way, is that they have mm. these really short life cycles. And they also have a constraint with their mouth. And it doesn't have to do with um, needing to, to attach to a nipple early on. It actually has to do way more with what makes rodents successful in the first place. And that mm. is that they are the gnawing machines of the mammalian world. So the word rodent comes from rodere in Latin, which means to gnaw. And that has everything to do with um, this gnawing uh -huh. apparatus with the ever-growing teeth that allows them to chew anything that they want. So we think that that constraint, which is really an adaptation for anything that they want to do, anything that they want to chew through, they can, um, has led to a great diversity of species, but not a great diversity in forms in rodents. And so that makes them a really interesting comparison to Australian marsupials, because actually they may have more in common with the marsupials than they do with other placental mammals. So anyway, that's that's kind of what we were we were sorting out and what I was focusing on uh, with my thesis. And yeah, happy to answer follow up questions that um, might be interesting to your audience. Yeah, well, um, that is really interesting, especially about how many rodents there are. But uh, I remember when we were talking earlier, you were saying about that um, there is a sort of a link in that there are some rodents which can hop. So I'm thinking yeah. of a link with, for instance, the kangaroo. Yeah, so uh, this is an example of convergent evolution. So um, mm. kangaroos are of course marsupials and then rodents are um, placentals, but there are hopping rodents in Australia that evolved once they got to Australia and they get around just like kangaroos. They're much smaller, of course, um, but they use that hopping locomotion, which is very efficient, especially in kind of a desert situation. And most of Australia is very arid. So that works very well. And they have oh, huge yes. ears as most um, hopping in rodents has evolved several times. It's evolved in North America as well. And I think in Africa too, um, they all tend to have large ears to hear things coming and um 
Yeah, so that's, again, an example of convergent evolution, but responding to the same uh, Australian climate. An important aspect of your work is the study of phylogenetic trees and the clades within those trees. How would you best describe these terms, and why exactly are they so useful in evolutionary biology, and specifically in the work that you're doing? Yeah, so evolutionary trees, I would say, is like as fundamental as coding as to other fields, because it's all about how we read the information that we're gathering about diversity and understanding how species are related to one another. So understanding what a clade is, a clade is defined as all of the organisms that descended from one common ancestor. So what's cool about a clade is that it can be as exclusive as, as you want, so you could just con constrain it to uh, all rodents and nothing else. Mm -hmm. Or you can make it more inclusive. So you could say all mammals. So that's a bit more inclusive because then you've got rodents and humans and kangaroos oh, and monotremes yeah. all in that one. Um, or you can you could zoom out even more to vertebrates, and then that would get you know dinosaurs, mammals, fish. Um, so all of that in there as well. Um, and this is helpful because this is how we start making inferences about traits that all of these organisms have. So we know that. All rodents, they're defined by having that gnawing apparatus. Um, and then mammals are defined by having milk for their young. And then vertebrates mm -hmm. uh, all have that nice backbone. So this is the kind of information that once, you're, once you know it, you can be given a tree, an evolutionary tree, about a new group of organisms. And I like to say it's a bit like a Rosetta Stone, so that once you know how to read it, you can start to understand new information really fast. And so if I give you a... Um, an evolutionary tree of dinosaurs, for example, you already know that they're really mm -hmm. flexible with their cervical um, vertebra. So maybe you, ha you start to have questions about that. Um, or if I give you an evolutionary tree of mammals, then you can know that they're almost certainly going to have seven. And then you can start focusing on other questions about, okay, well, are they a placental? Are they a marsupial? And so that starts to make it really easy kind of chunk information and um, start to generate questions about new organisms that you might find. So understanding how to read an evolutionary tree, which is basically uh, made up of a series of clades that are organi organized like sets. And you can kind of think of them as like sets within sets. And that's basically all an evolutionary tree is. Um, you are a human. You are also a mammal. You are also a vertebrate. Like that's, that's kind of how you, you situate yourself on the tree, and then you can do that for other, other organisms. So what I've done is I've um, designed a game based on this um, principle. And what's cool is that as a game designer, sets mm. are really great. You can make a lot of games about collecting sets. And one of the most simple ones that you've probably learned is Go Fish. And so the game mm. that I've made is called Go Extinct because you're collecting not just sets, you're collecting clades, and uh, you're using the evolutionary tree to do so. Well, speaking of evolutionary trees, this brings us to the great new card game you've developed called Go Extinct. So how did this idea come to you, and how was the game played? Yeah, so this idea came to me partly because I failed at teaching it the first time I tried to teach it. So right after I graduated, I had the opportunity to teach in a course called Intro to Human Biology. And it was a course that combined both biology and social sciences in a way that uh, attracted a very diverse group of students who were interested from you know, being doctors to doing great things with uh, health policy in Washington. Um, and I needed to make it accessible for people with a variety of backgrounds in biology. And mm -hmm. evolutionary trees are not a linear idea. And it's difficult to teach a nonlinear idea in a linear setting, like in a book or with a lecture or even office hours. Mm. So um, this game was sort of my solution to feeling like I hadn't done, um, hadn't taught it well enough, uh, because it's a concept that's near and dear to my heart. It was important to do that. And so um, games are wonderful to teach a lot of scientific concepts because, like science, games are dynamic. And like a lot of scientific ideas, they're also systems. 
They're just systems mm. that happen to be fun. Uh, so that makes them a great engaging teaching tool because with a game like Go Extinct, it's designed so that your collecting sets, those sets happen to be uh, clades. So for example, you can collect all the dinosaurs, uh, but in order to collect them, you get choices based on what you want to ask for. So you could ask for what you're missing. You could ask for the Apatosaurus, but that sort of gives away what you're looking for. So you can be a little sneakier by asking for any dinosaur, and then another person can give you any one dinosaur card. And you can go uh, even more um, inclusive. So you could ask for any vertebrate and get a whole lot of cards potentially. And what this does is it allows players to practice that fundamental reading of the tree and thinking about these clades and thinking about it in a way where what you ask for, what level you ask for, impacts the probability of getting something you want. So as you're playing, you're making these decisions based on what you want from the game, and you're not necessarily noticing that you're practicing reading a tree. And I think that's the best way to learn is to re not really realize that the skill that you're learning is, yeah. you know, you're going to be tested on it later, but it's actually something that will be fundamental to the, whatever you want to do related to biology. And um, again, reading evolutionary trees is fundamental to anything in biology because evolution is the light with which everything makes sense in biology. So yeah, I'm really proud of the game and that it works for um, kids as young as eight and that it's fun mm -hmm. and that people want to play it again. I have teachers tell me that they have students coming in during lunch asking to play. So I think that's, that's the measure of its success is that kids want to uh. play it again. So that's, that's really cool. And it speaks to the power of having fun while learning, which because we're mammals, we, we learn through play. So that's another, another little biological insight. When, when I hear you uh, describing it, I also think that in a way, what, the way that you select uh, the cards sort of reminds me of natural selection and how that works in a way. So you're teaching that as well. <laughs> Am I right? Well, it's it's more based on macroevolution and like patterns that have happened over the course of long series of um, of microevolution. So it's not quite that you're selecting against traits because you're you have um, org whole organisms in your like species in your hand. Um, oh, okay. But I think there's definitely potential for that kind of mechanic to teach microevolution. I'll, I'll have to think about that, and I'll credit you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <no. laughs> So if anyone wants to support this game and science and evolution in general, they can head on over to Kickstarter, isn't that right? Yes, that's right. So I'm delighted to say that I've, I've got to team up with this amazing 14-year-old author, uh, Bailey Harris, who's written a number of books about science. And the most recent one was about evolution. I helped her about, with that a little bit. And she uses a number of very charismatic carnivores as examples in her book. So we decided to make mm. a Stardust edition of the game, uh, which is all about the evolution of cats and dogs. And so you can find it on Kickstarter as Stardust Edition Go Extinct. Thank you for checking out the Kickstarter for our new game. Hi, my name is Ariel Marcy, and I'm a biologist, science communicator, and a game designer. I'm super excited to work with Bailey and the entire Stardust team in making our new game. In our new game, your strategy will involve finding common ancestors on the evolutionary tree, which is a super fundamental skill for all scientists. have a skunk? No. Go extinct.
Kay, that was a great interview and your work is really fascinating. Great also to hear about your gaming work. It's a very cool idea indeed and a great way to teach science in a fun way. I'll leave links to Go Extinct's Kickstarter campaign as well as your own social media links in the description below. And all that's left to say is thank you once again, Ariel, for coming on to Evolution Soup. Thank you. It's been a delight and I love your Instagram. So thanks for all you do. <laughs> thank you very much.